Okay, so for this review, we're starting off with question one, place each of the given relationships into the correct category. So the categories are function and not a function. So I'm going to do the vertical line test on each of these so that I can see if it's a function. Remember, if you have a graph, you can do a vertical line test. Vertical line is a line that goes straight up and down. I know that's not very straight, but you can imagine it would be. So that's my vertical line, and you can see that my vertical line touches it twice. If my vertical line touches it twice, it is not a function. If it touches it three times, four times, five times, not a function. Functions must touch my vertical line only one time. Take a look at the second graph. One time. This vertical line touched the second graph just one time. So the first one, the sideways V, that is not a function. And the second one, the curvy one, that is a function. I am going to um, drag these into their boxes now, but I have to clear the screen first. <laughs> That's the way annotating works. I have to clear the screen and then drag them in. So first one, not a function. Let me drag it in. Not a function. And I don't know why that shifted like that, but the second one is a function, okay? Now, let me see, were there any questions? Use the scratch pad? Okay, I don't know. <laughs> All right, next, let's do this one. So I'm gonna annotate. So for a function, you want every input, which is the domain, so you want everything in the input to only have one output. So let's take a look at the number zero. This is one of our inputs. It has two arrows coming out of it. That means this input has two outputs. That means this is not a function. No, <laughs> because our inputs had two outputs. The input of zero had two outputs, and a function should only have one output for every input. Any questions? Okay, let me give you an example where um, just just look at this example. This one, every single input in the domain, I know my handwriting is trash right now, just bear with me. Okay, every single input in the domain still only has one output. Even though they're all pointing to the same thing, this would be a function because every single input only has one output. They all only have the output of five versus in our original thing that they gave us, there are two arrows coming from zero. This makes it not a function, okay? So there's two examples here for you. Any questions? If you ever have a question, just interrupt me and type it or say question or say wait, and then I'll know to wait, okay? But other than that, I'm just gonna keep going because these reviews usually take quite a bit of time for us to go over. So I'm gonna drag that into the not a function, not a function. Okay, and then last but not least, we have our T table. So I'm just gonna use my mouse to point this input has one output. 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 Okay, and nothing repeated itself over here. It was a negative 10, negative 5, 0, 5. There was no repeating numbers. So that means this is a function because every single input only has one output. All of these inputs only have the output that's right next to it. And none of these repeat it. There's not a second five here and then like a nine or something like that. So this is a function. Are there any questions? Just type the word wait into the chat if you have a question so I know I'm waiting for you. All righty. Cool. Let's go to the next one. Um, next, match each of its function, match each function to its graph. Okay, so I don't know if you guys remember, but there's this website called um, desmos.com. 
Oh my God, I almost forgot it. Desmos.com, it will help you graph these. So literally you just need to go to desmos.com and figure out what these look like. Desmos.com. So here's the website. If you ever forget it, whenever you're doing your test, you can pause the video here so that you can see the word desmos.com. Then you click graphing calculator. And then you can just type your stuff here. So our first one is um, negative x squared plus two. So I'm literally just gonna type negative x squared plus two. Negative x squared. How do you type squared? You can use the um, shift and six and it'll let you type there. Another way is I think people use the keyboard here and then they just press this button. Okay, so if I didn't do that, I could have I could have opened up my keyboard and pressed the a squared button and it will put negative x squared it was negative x squared plus two okay plus two all right so move that out of the way you can see it is a quadratic function facing downwards so it's like an upside down u so that's what i'm going to look for oh look there it is drag and drop my upside down u okay then we have f of x is equal to 3 to the power of x. Let me get rid of our old one. I could type the f of x if I like. So I'm going to do that. f of x is equal to 3 to the power of. How do you type to the power of? Once again, you can press shift and 6. And then it will allow you to type in the exponents. Or if you don't remember that, show the keypad and use the a with the b over there. The b means you can type. So versus this one will make you have a two there. This one will allow you to type the x. All right, so is it three to the power of x, is that it? Yeah, three to the power of x. Okay, so we have a curvy graph that looks like that. Oh, there it is, drag and drop. Next, we have x minus three, f of x is equal to x minus three. I'm going to just delete that, x minus three, okay move that out of the way. It is a straight line. This is a linear function. Okay, it's a straight line going upwards, an increasing linear function. There it is. Drag and drop. And then of course, this last one must be here, but let me just type it in just in case. Absolute value of x minus 2. Oh, hold on. Let me fix the attendance. Okay, absolute value of x minus 2. How do you type absolute value? It's above your enter key. So if you look above the enter key on your keyboard, you see the straight line and the slash. So you press shift, press that button, and then x minus 2, or was it x minus 3? x minus 2. And then shift and the button there again. OK. And then as you can see, absolute value is the V-shaped graph. And then, oh, there it is, the V-shaped graph, drag and drop. And remember, this is all being recorded. So then um, if you missed a little bit because you're lagging, it will be recorded and put on the website. You can use this recording on the test, all right? Okay, any questions, please type wait in the chat and I will know to wait. And then I can also go backwards if you're lagging and you just needed to see. But it looks like nobody's saying wait. So we're going to go to the next question. Please don't feel shy. Just tell me wait if you need me to. OK. Next. Look at the given graph. Which of the following are qualities of the given graph? OK. So let's see. A and B says graph has an absolute minimum or maximum. So a minimum is a very low point on the graph. Absolute minimum is like the lowest point on the graph. Absolute maximum is the point where it's the absolute highest on the graph. So let me draw some for you. A minimum would look like that. This would be the minimum and this would be the maximum. Another way a minimum could be a corner or a maximum can also be a corner. It doesn't have to be curvy or straight. So which one do we have? You can type it in the chat, minimum or maximum? You can use M-I-N or M-A-X to be short. All right, good. I see a lot of you, at least 
four of you have typed minimum. Good. We have a minimum here. Right over here. That's a minimum. Good job. Let me clear the drawings. We have an absolute minimum. Okay. The graph is continuous or the graph is discrete. Let me annotate and remind you what those mean. Continuous means it is a solid line. So here's a continuous graph. And then a discrete graph would be made of dots with gaps in between. So here's the same graph, but discrete. So do we have ours looking continuous or discrete? You can shorten it with C-O-N-T or D-I-S-C for continuous or discrete. Which one do we have? All right. Before I even asked, you guys were like, we have continuous, Miss Jade. Yes, good job. We have a continuous graph because ours is made of a solid line. It's not a bunch of dots that are disconnected. Good job. Okay, so we have continuous. All right, and then the next is we have linear and quadratic. Let me remind you what those look like. Linear has the word line in it because linear graphs are a straight line. So linear looks like flat line, increasing line, decreasing line. And here's quadratic. It will either look like a U facing up or down. Which one do we have? Good, quadratic, good, good, good. And I like that you guys know that you can shorten it. <laughs> good, quadratic, good job. All right, so we've selected A, C, and F, and those were our only options. So we're good. Let's go to another one. Look at the given graph. Which of the following are qualities of the given graph? Okay, so we already talked about continuous and discontinuous, which is pretty much the same as discrete. I don't know why they use that word suddenly, but this is discrete, okay? Essentially continuous or not continuous. Do we have a line or do we have dots? Which one? All right, we have continuous, yes. Sorry, I, I realize it takes a little bit of time for you to open the chat and type, but yes, you guys are right. We have continuous because discontinuous would be like the bunch of dots, right? Discontinuous be like dot, 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 versus continuous is like straight line. Good job. Okay, next two options are the graph is increasing or the graph is constant. Let me remind you what increasing, constant and decreasing look like, even though it doesn't give us the option of, wait, no, it does. Look at option F says the graph is decreasing. Why is it out of order? I don't know, but okay, here's increasing, constant and decreasing looks like this. Which one do we have? All right, good. You guys are typing the whole word. Increasing, yes. Ours is going from left to right. We read it from left to right, just like English, left. So right is going upwards. Upwards means we are increasing. So from between C, D, and F, we're gonna choose C for increasing. All right, so we've covered A, B, C, D, and F. Now we just need to check out if it's linear. So linear, remember, just means a straight line. Is this a straight line? Is this linear? Yes or no? Is this a straight line? Yes, yes, good. I see a lot of yeses and linears in the chat. Good, this is a linear graph. Nice, good job. Okay, if anybody needs me to wait at any point, please just type the word wait and I will, um, just at any point at all, ever, okay? Now I'm gonna go to the next question. I'm always a little concerned for time when we go over stuff. I just want to make sure we finish. Okay, consider the two graphs shown. Graph one, graph two, okay. Sophie claims that graph one represents a geometric sequence because it is an exponential function. Mike claims that the graph two represents an arithmetic sequence because it is a linear function. Who is correct? Okay, so this one is just like, if you remember it or you don't, so I'm gonna tell you um, both Sophie and Mike are correct. If you have a geometric sequence, oh, I can't highlight, let me annotate. Geometric sequences become exponential functions, okay? 
So Sophie is correct because geometric and exponential, they are the same. And then I also want you to remember that arithmetic goes with linear. So arithmetic sequences become linear functions. They are the same. So they are both correct, okay? Geometric is with exponential. Arithmetic is with linear, okay? And also just, just in case, geometric, if somebody says geometric and linear are paired, this is wrong. Geometric does not go to linear. Geometric goes to exponential. Arithmetic goes to linear. Okay, so that's just um, a reminder. So we did learn this like a long time ago. So hopefully now you can remember geometric exponential, arithmetic linear. Any questions? Alrighty, if you ever have a question, just let me know. You can type it privately to my iPad if you're shy. Next. When it is first purchased, a tree sapling measures three centimeters tall. Every month thereafter, the sapling doubles in size. Enter a number in each box to represent the height of the sapling in centimeters for the first five months as a numeric sequence. So when it is first purchased, a tree sapling measures three centimeters tall. Start off with three. So that was the first month. <laughs> then every month thereafter, the sapling doubles in size. So we're going to take this three and we're going to double it. So we're going to multiply by two. So three multiplied by two is, I'm already says it, six. Okay, what's after the six? We're going to double it again. Double it again. What's double of six? Type it in the chat. Twelve. Good, good. Okay, so let me type twelve. All right, so we've doubled it again. Now, what's the next month? What's after twelve? All right, twenty-four. Good, you guys are ahead of me. Okay, what's after twenty-four? Forty-eight. Good, so we're just doubling, doubling, doubling because that's what they said. They said when a tree is first purchased, a sapling measures three. So we start off with three. Every month thereafter, the sapling doubles in size. So we've doubled, doubled, double, and double. So I know it doesn't ask for it here, but I'm going to write our um, explicit formula for this, okay? So let me annotate. This is um, a geometric sequence because we multiply it every single time. When it says doubling in size, halving or tripling something like that that means you are multiplying by something every single time when you multiply by something every single time this is geometric so geometric explicit formula explicit i'm sorry for the ugly handwriting the explicit formula looks like this g sub n is equal to g sub 1 multiplied by r to the power of n minus 1. So I'm going to write out the explicit formula in here. I know it doesn't ask for it here, but on the test, there is a question that looks like it asks for explicit formula. So I'm writing it here in our review so that later on you can go find this question. I was trying to find review questions that looked exactly like the exam questions with different numbers, except I couldn't find one that asked for explicit. So I'm just gonna go put the explicit in right here. So explicit formula looks like this. We're gonna have g sub n is equal to, g sub one, in case you guys don't remember, is literally just the first term. So this one represents the first term, like the term number. So when it says g sub one, it literally just means three. So I'm putting the three here. Okay, and then the other thing that's a part of it is the R. The R, it's what we multiply by. So we're doubling in size, we are multiplying by two every single time. Multiply by two every single time. Multiply by two, multiply by two. So our R is two, okay? So you could write it like three parentheses too, that also works. 
So three times two to the power of n minus one. All right, here's our explicit formula. This is the explicit formula. Okay, I'm just gonna box it so you know. This is the explicit formula. Now we can use our explicit formula to solve for the sapling height after eight months. Let me see, I saw a question. Is it just mine or is the fifth box in the bottom of three? Oh, if your um if your fifth box is on the bottom, it's just because you have a smaller screen. It's fine. Yeah, maybe with the Chromebooks, it's a smaller computer than the computer they gave me, so it's fine. Okay. All right, so we are going to use our explicit formula to find the height of the sapling after eight months. When it says eight months, that means our n is equal is equal to eight. So I'm going to plug in eight. So g sub eight is equal to three parentheses two to the power of eight minus one. That's a one. That is a one. Oh my goodness. Okay, so you see all I did was I plugged in eight into our explicit formula. So this is going to help us solve for the height. Okay. Three parentheses, two to the power of eight minus one is seven. And then now on your calculator, whatever calculator you have, you can do two to the power of seven and then multiply that by three. According to PEMDAS, you want to do the two to the power of seven first. You want to do the exponent. Exponent comes before the multiplication. So two to the power of seven is two to the power of seven, 128. And then we're going to multiply that by three equals 384, okay? Any questions on this one? We have that, it said it was wrong. Hmm. Then I'll fix it. Sometimes you have to like manually, sometimes I have to manually go in and fix it. <laughs> I don't know why, but edge elastic's really weird like that, okay? So it is 384. Other questions? Remember, if you're typing it in the chat privately, you're typing it to my iPad because I can't see what you're typing here. Okay, let me pause recording. Okay, let's clear all drawings and type 384. 384. Okay, let's go to the next one. Graph the first five ordered pairs for the sequence given by the formula a sub n is equal to two plus four parentheses n minus one. So here they gave us the explicit formula for an arithmetic sequence. And we're going to plug in numbers so that we can get to the first five ordered pairs. I'm going to annotate. Okay. So to get the first ordered pair, we want to plug in one because we want the first term then you plug in one. So I'm gonna write a sub one is equal to two plus four, one minus one. This is getting our first term because I want the first term, I'm gonna plug in the number one. This is gonna give me two plus four times zero because one minus one is zero, which is two plus four times zero is zero. So then two plus zero is two. My first point is two. So that means I'm gonna plot the point one to represent the first point, two to represent what the first term is. So one comma two is the first thing I'm going to um, plot. So I'm gonna click on the point and then one comma two, there we go.
Okay. Then I'm going to plug in the second point. Sorry, I was responding to a message. That's why I was like kind of slow. Okay. So the second point, I'm going to plug in 2 for n. 2 plus 4, 2 minus 1. Literally just following this equation, except I'm just plugging in something for n. So if I want the second point, I plug in 2. All right, and then we're going to simplify this. So 2 minus 1 is 1. And then that's going to be 2 plus 4 times 1 is 4. So 2 plus 4 is 6. That means for the second point, I'll have 2 comma representing the second point, the second term, and the term is 6. So 2 comma 6. I'm going to take the point and go 2 and then 6. There we go. Let's keep going. Annotate. Third point, I'm plugging in 3. three oh, sorry. Undo. 2 plus 4. I'm only plugging in the 3 where the n is. So the n appears right here in the parentheses. 3 minus 1. Okay, so that's 2 plus 4. And then 3 minus 1 is 2. That's 2 plus 8 which means I'm gonna have 10. So then the third point is three comma 10. Okay. Point three, 10. Okay. So I'm gonna show the work for the fourth one. Two plus four. And then we're plugging in the number four. Minus one. So it's two plus four. And then four minus one is three. So it's two plus four times three is 12. So two plus 12 is 14. And then that point is our fourth term. So the fourth term is 14. So it's four comma 14. So then I'm going to take the point, and go 4, 14. I know it's kind of in the writing now, I'm sorry, but I can't scroll it out of the way. So it's just gonna have to be in the writing, my bad. And for the last one, we want the fifth term. So a sub five is equal to two plus four, five minus one, because we're plugging in the number five this time. So it's 2 plus 4. 5 minus 1 is 4. So it's 2 plus 4 times 4. So that's 2 plus 16 because 4 times 4 is 16. And then 2 plus 16 is 18. So then what point am I plugging in? Well, it's the fifth term. And the term was 18. So 5 comma 18. Now I'm going to take that point. And it's 5 and 18. There we go. Oof, I know, a lot of writing, but we got our five points, and I'll give you guys a chance to tell me if you have any questions. Let's go to the next one. Oh, wait, I have to annotate and clear all drawings, because otherwise it'll just stay there. All right, now I'm going to go to the next one. Is the test going to have the same number of questions? The test will have 16 questions. So you know how I re, you know how on this one? I wrote the explicit formula. There's a question, there's an extra question on the test where it looks just like this, but it asks for an explicit formula. So that's why I did the explicit formula for this example. So it's just one extra question on the test. I just couldn't find another problem that looked just like it for some reason. So that's why I did the whole, here's the explicit formula for number six. That's why. Okay, so there's 16 questions on the final. All right, there's no part B. Okay, let's go to the next one. Complete the table given below. We're given two um, functions and we don't know what they look like yet, but we would need to determine they're increasing, decreasing, or constant. Remember, increasing looks like this, so from left to right it goes upwards. Decreasing looks like that, this is decreasing. From left to right it goes down. And then constant is flat, okay? So constant is just a flat line straight across. 
So let's take a look. Negative two thirds times x. Go to desmos.com, get rid of whatever equation you have there. F of x is equal to, I forgot what it was, <laughs> negative two thirds times x. Negative two thirds times x. You can just type it like that. All right, is this increasing, decreasing, or constant? Type it in the chat. Increasing, decreasing, or constant? All right, good job. Yes, this is decreasing. You read it from left to right, it goes down. Left to right, it goes down. So this is decreasing, decreasing, okay? Let's take a look at the next one. F of x is equal to 2.5. So I'm going to delete that, 2.5. But I do type the f of x. When you have just a number, you want to type it as f of x is equal to 2.5. Look what happens when I just type 2.5, nothing. So then you want to make sure um, if you're just given a number as your equation, you type f of x is equal to 2.5. Turn that back on. OK, so now you can see it's a flat line, which is constant, as you guys have already stated before I even asked, which is great. It's great, good job. Constant because it's flat. So decreasing and constant, okay? All right, let's go to the next one. Write an explicit formula for each sequence given below. All right, so here we're gonna write some explicit formulas for these. I just noticed how terribly written this first one is. Okay, but I will show you i'll show you how it splits up the numbers my gosh i just looked at it right now it's like that's terrible they should not have written it like that okay i need to pick a color all right so the first number is one the next number is negative 10 the next number is 100 positive then the next number is this it's negative a thousand. I don't know why they would put the comma in with the negative a thousand because now it looks like negative one and then zero. I apologize. So then, this is negative a thousand. And then it's 10,000. I almost put the comma there. Okay. So here are the, here's the sequence. Does anybody know? Um, what the pattern is. Are we adding every time? Are we multiplying every time? And what are we doing that by? Does anybody know? Yes, okay, good, two more. Michael says negative 10, Alana says multiply. Yes, we are multiplying by negative 10, good job. So every single time we are multiplying, by negative 10. So one times negative 10 is negative 10. If you multiply negative 10, I can't write up here the, my computer doesn't like, it's kind of broken up here. <laughs> multiply by negative 10, my goodness. Then you'll get positive 100. Notice that the signs are flopping. So it's a positive, it's a negative, it's a positive, it's a negative. That automatically means you are multiplying by a negative number. So we are multiplying by negative 10. Good job. When we write our explicit formula, let me show you the basics is um, g sub one times r, I guess I can write it like that, to the power of n minus one. So let's write it out. g sub one is the first term. Our first term is one. So we have g sub n is equal to one multiplying by this r. The r is what you multiply by every single time. So it's times negative 10 times negative 10. So our r is negative 10. And then we put this to the power of n minus 1. That is a 1. I'm trying to write, but my, um, my computer doesn't want me to write neatly for you guys. I apologize. There we go. So this would be our explicit formula. Are there any questions on this one? Okay, I'm gonna type it in. One parentheses, negative 10. And then how would I type the exponent? Let's see if there's a button here for us. Oh, there it is. And then n minus one. Okay. 
Let's do the next one. Annotate. All right. Once again, it looks confusing because there's decimals, but um, we can figure it out. We got this. So I'm going to rewrite the equation. Yeah, I'll just rewrite it under this line. So we have 10.2, and then we have 2.2. It's a comma. And then we have negative 5.8. Negative thirteen point eight. There's a point there, <laughs> and then negative twenty one point eight. All right. So does anyone know? Are we adding, subtracting, and or adding, multiplying? What are we doing, and by what? Subtract eight, says Alana. Good job. Yes, we are subtracting eight every time. So let me write that out. I'm just going to write it on the bottom now. So we're minusing 8. 10.2 minus 8 would give us 2.2. If you minus 8 again, it would give us negative 5.8. Minus 8 again, and so on and so forth. You are correct. We are subtracting 8 every time. So since we are subtracting, 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 we have an arithmetic formula. So I'm going to write it over here. Just Oops. Write it over here because I have more space. So a sub n is equal to a sub 1 plus d parentheses n minus 1. This is the general formula for arithmetic explicit formulas. So what is a sub 1? That little 1 over here, that tells us it's the first term. So that would be 10.2. All right, and then we have plus D. What is our D? The D is the common difference. It is what we are subtracting every single time or adding. In this case, it's a minus eight. So for the plus D, I'm gonna write minus eight. And then last but not least, we just have parentheses N minus one. So here is the thing we're gonna type, 10.2 minus eight parentheses N minus one. So over here, Oof, sorry, 10.2 minus eight parentheses n minus one. All right, there, now it's out of the way. So I'm gonna pause this and see if you guys have any questions. All right, let's clear all this and go to the next one. Consider the two sequences, uh, two sequences given. And then there they are. Write a recursive formula for both the sequences. Oh, hold on, let me fix the attendance. Okay. Write a recursive formula. Oh, okay. So for the recursive formula, it's different from the explicit formula, but let's analyze the first sequence first. Annotate. What is happening in this first sequence? What are we doing every single time? It's a little bit hard to tell, um, but does anybody have an idea? Here's a clue that's arithmetic because they put an A there versus the second one will be geometric. So we're adding or subtracting something. All right, so since we know it's arithmetic, we can figure out what the pattern is by picking two numbers that are right next to each other. So I just pick those two. They're just right next to each other. I'll pick them. So I pick any two numbers that are right next to each other, and you can subtract the second one and the first one. So, sorry, those are supposed to be arrows. So the common difference, which is the pattern of the arithmetic sequence, you will take the negative one half minus the negative one fourth. See, I do the second one minus the first one. Okay, so let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, let's simplify this. Okay, they are two fractions, and in order to subtract fractions, you need to make them have the same denominator. This one has a denominator of four. This one has a denominator of two. So I can turn the two into a four by multiplying by, that's multiplying the top and the bottom of this fraction by two. So the negative one half turns into negative two over four. 
So negative one times two on the top gave us negative two. The two times two on the bottom gave us the four. Okay. And then we have negative two fourths minus negative one fourth. When you subtract a negative, that is adding the positive. So it's really plus one fourth. And then now you just have negative two plus one gives us negative one over four. So one person did send me a message that says subtracting. And you're correct. Because our common difference is negative, that means we are subtracting. And what are we subtracting? We are subtracting one fourth every single time. So our common difference is um, negative one fourth. And so for the recursive formula, it looks like this. For arithmetic, it just looks like a sub n is equal to a sub n minus one plus d. All right, so the only thing we have to plug in for this is the common difference. So it will look like, give me a second to write it. It will look like that. Okay, so that's what we're going to type. a sub n is equal to a sub n minus one. So to do the sub, you press this button. This one helps you type on the top and small. This one helps you type on the bottom and small, okay? So this will help you type on the bottom. And, oops, there we go, n minus one. And then I use the right arrow to stop typing on the bottom. And I go minus one over four. If you want to type a fraction, you can also press this button. But what I did was I used the slash that's right next to the shift key on the keyboard, like on my computer keyboard, right next to the shift key is the slash. And that's how I type fractions. But you can also type a fraction using this. So either way. Any questions on this one? Okay, let's do the geometric one now. Annotate, clear the drawings because I ran out of space. How do you do the bottom end again? Okay, let me, it's this button. Ah, oh my gosh, my mouse. Okay, right here, this one. Oh wait, yeah, can you see my mouse? This one, this one, <laughs> this one. All right, every time I move my mouse on the very bottom of the page, like stuff starts popping up for me and it's just gets in the way. <laughs> this one, I don't know how else to show you. This. Okay, cool, let's do the geometric annotate. So remember they gave us the clue that it was geometric by showing us what letter, right? They're like, the second one is geometric because they use the letter G. So we can figure out what the pattern is by choosing any two numbers that are next to each other. So I just choose those two because they're right next to each other. And we're gonna find the common ratio, which is the pattern of geometric ones by taking the second number. So negative 40,000 divided by the first number, 4,000. So if you do that, you're going to get negative 10. Just on your calculator, negative 40,000 divided by 4,000 positive will give you negative 10. So the common ratio is negative 10, which means you are multiplying by negative 10 every single time. So the geometric recursive formula looks like this. So the only thing that you need to replace in this formula is the r. And the r we just solved for was negative 10 times negative 10. So that's what we're going to type. g sub n minus 1 times negative 10. g, and then I want the little thing. So, well, it's not showing it to me. Okay. Well, that's an issue. <laughs> I can't click it. <laughs> 
What if I make my screen smaller? Will that help? There we go. I don't know how that helped, but it did. Okay, so I made my screen smaller and then I made my screen bigger again and somehow I've allowed myself to type that. I just, let's see, okay. <laughs> and minus one. Oh great, it went away. Let's see. Trying to make my screen bigger again. There it is. And there's one. I can't see where I'm typing. Oh, it worked. You can move the big number box. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> you can move this. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, and then times negative 10. <laughs> see, if you didn't tell me that, I never would have known. And then other people with my same issue would have struggled. <laughs> So well, thank you so much. You can move this thing when it's like that. Okay, anyways, so this is the button you use to type the small numbers on the bottom. And now I know that you can move it out of the way. <laughs> anyways, does anybody have a question on the math part now? <laughs> All right, <laughs> so. Let's do part B. It says, what is the missing term in each of the sequences? So let me clear my drawings because they're just in the way. And then let's do it for sequence one. So sequence one, we said that the formula is subtracting a fourth every single time. So we're going to take the previous term, so negative one half, and we're going to subtract one fourth so that we can find our missing term. So take the previous term and subtract one fourth. Literally just follow the pattern. We said we are minusing one fourth every single time. So that's what we're gonna do. So in order to subtract this, you want them to have the same denominator and we don't have that right now. This one is a two, this one is a four. So you're going to take this first fraction and multiply, that's a multiply, multiply by two on the top and bottom so that we can get negative two fourths. So the negative one half change itself to negative two fourths. Minus one fourth. And now they have the same denominator. They both have a four, which means you can just subtract across the top. So negative two minus one is negative three, and it's over four. So this is the missing term right here. Okay. So I'm going to go type that in as our missing term. Negative three over four. Wow, that's totally just in the way and I can't see anything. <laughs> there we go. Negative three fourths. I'm just gonna put it there. All right, and then sequence two, we're gonna go ahead and do that one. Clear all drawings. I know the number box is just, it's just not great, but it is what it is. So in sequence two, we are multiplying because it's geometric. So we said we are multiplying every time. What are we multiplying by? Negative 10. We found the R, it was negative 10. So to figure out this missing piece right here, we're gonna take the previous term, which I was trying to point to, and we're literally just gonna multiply it by negative 10. So negative four times negative 10, that gives us positive 40. So our missing term over here is 40. So I'm gonna go type that in. Are there any questions? Wow, wonderful. It's just blocking my view. So 40. Are there any questions? <laughs> I'm gonna pause the thing so you guys can have a chance to type or something. Resume recording and then clear all the drawings. Next. Okay, consider the sequence below, describe the pattern. So this one, edge elastic's gonna mark us wrong because I have to manually grade it, but we have a pattern here. We can talk about either the number of sides increasing or the number of corners increasing. It's up to you, but both will pretty much be the same thing. You just gotta describe it in your own words because the sides are increasing. The corners are also increasing. You're not wrong either way. I wanna talk about the number of sides. That's just me. This one has one, two, three sides. 
One, two, three, four, five sides. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven sides. Okay, so when I describe the pattern, I'm gonna just type it in words. The shape, if I could type proper words, okay. The shape increases the number of sides by two every time. One sentence is good enough. I described the pattern. Okay, before I scroll and shift all of my annotations, are there any questions for this part? All right, just type wait and I can always go back, but I'm gonna scroll now. Okay, the teacher asked the students to draw the next two figures of the pattern. The responses she got are shown. So which response is correct, explain. So I'm going to annotate again. So originally we had three, five, seven. So let's double check these to make sure we should get nine and we should get 11, right? Because if we're still adding two every time, it should be nine and 11 next. So I'm gonna take a look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Oh, that looks good. Let's take a look at response two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh-oh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, that's not right. If we want our pattern to be continuing, we should get nine and 11 next because it increased by two every single time. We had three, five, seven. We should get nine and 11 next. So response one has to be correct. And yeah, okay. I just realized in order to type here, I have to clear my drawings, otherwise everything's gonna shift. So I'm gonna clear my drawings. Let me know if I'm going too fast though, okay? You can always just type, wait, type it to my iPad and I'll go back. But we want 9 and 11, and that was given to us in response 1. Response 1 was correct because it followed the pattern of adding 2 every time. It had 9 sides and 9 sides for the 4th figure and 11 sides for the fifth figure. There you go, I described it. Can I read it out loud again? Yes. Response one was correct because it followed the pattern of adding two every single time. It had nine sides for the fourth figure and 11 sides for the fifth figure. So I'm just describing that it fits the pattern. And I explain what the pattern is because I said adding two every time. Oops, I said adding two every time, that's explaining the pattern. And then I said that it has nine sides for the fourth figure and 11 sides for the fifth figure. So I said it's correct because it followed our pattern of adding two every time. Okay. I think, let's see, we have 13 minutes left. All right, I'm gonna go to the next one, okay? Enter a number in each box and make a numeric sequence to represent the first five figures. So we literally have to just go back up here. Remember this was three, five, seven. Remember that? Three, five, seven. Three. Oh my gosh, get out of my way. <laughs> ah, five. Oh my God. Okay. Seven. Oh, isn't this, isn't this lovely? Okay. After three, five, seven, it was nine which you can't see me type. And then after nine was 11, which you also cannot see me type. Okay, so here, <laughs> three, five, seven, nine, 11, after you couldn't see me type them, but here's the final res result, okay? I don't know why the box is so annoying. Three, five, seven, nine, 11. Okay, we need to write an explicit formula for the sequence. Remember, we are adding to every single time. Let me give you the explicit formula. General form is a sub n is equal to a sub one plus d n minus one. So a sub n is equal to, remember that a sub one is the first term 
plus the D is the, uh, what's it called? Common difference, sorry. The common difference, which is what we are adding every two, single time. So we are adding two, adding two, adding two. So I'll have plus two parentheses and minus one. Okay, that is our explicit formula. I'm gonna keep annotating here our recursive formula. So I'll write this as explicit. For the recursive formula, we have a sub n is equal to a sub n minus one plus d. So we're just gonna write a sub n is equal to a sub n minus one. And then for the letter d, remember that was just adding two. So now that I've written both of those out, I'm gonna type them in over here. So the first one is three plus two parentheses n minus one. Okay, and then for the recursive, we want to move this out of the way so we can type. We have um, a sub n minus one. Remember that you have to type lower right here, and then plus two. Okay, in the sequence, how many sides will a tenth figure? How, how many sides will a tenth figure has? Great grammar, right? But we need to figure out the tenth figure. So we already uh, have the first four, five. We already have the first five. You can just continue adding two each time, or you can plug the number ten into our explicit formula. That would probably be easier because look at part G. You want to find the hundredth figure. You don't want to write out a hundred terms. You want to plug it into your explicit formula. So let's practice with that. I'm going to practice writing it into our explicit formula. Okay, I'm gonna erase the recursive because I just need space. Sorry, recursive. If you need this more, remember that it's always uh, recorded. So, oops. Wow. A sub 10, so I'm gonna plug in 10, is equal to three plus two times 10 minus one. That's three plus two times nine. I'm gonna keep writing it over here. That's three plus 18. And that would be 21. So the 10 figure will have 21 sides. You can't see me type that, but there it is, 21. And then when we want the 100th figure, we're going to, do I have enough space there? a sub 100, we're going to plug in 100, 3 plus 2 parentheses 100 minus 1. So that's 3 plus um, 2 times 99. That's 3 plus 198. And then that would be 201. So for the last one is 201, which you cannot see me type it in, but there it is. Okay. So I realize um, we're probably running out of time, but I'm going to keep going, okay? <laughs> so that that way we can at least try to finish as many problems as we can. And then I'll just keep recording throughout the break. And if you want to stay, you can, but I understand if you need to go to your next class, okay? But I will record it all so that at the end, it will be uploaded, all right? I know, the box is so annoying, I am so sorry. Edulastic is not my favorite website. I'm just gonna say that, but <laughs> let's go to the next problem. All right, let me clear all the drawings. And then I can go to the next problem because I just want to try to finish. Okay, consider the graph shown below. What's the average rate of change for f of x? So the average rate of change is the slope. But in order to find the slope, you want to find nice points on this graph. And by nice points, I mean like, this is a nice point because it has, it's at an intersection versus like right here is not a nice point, right? Because that's not on the grid. And that's just not a nice point. So don't pick a nice, don't pick that one. Pick nice points like here, 
you know I'm marking it really badly, but that's just how it is. Here's another nice point. Okay, so you find two nice points and you want to do rise over run. Okay, rise is the up and down, up being positive, down being negative, run is the left and right, right being um, positive, left being negative. So we want to find out from one point, how do you get to the next? So I'm going to go this way and then this way. So I've gone up, up one, that's a positive one, over, and then I went right four, which is a positive four. So one fourth. Okay, you want to simplify it. So it's one fourth. Some of you might have chosen like here and here, that would have been two over eight. That's totally fine. Rise two, run eight. This simplifies to one fourth. One fourth is still your final answer. Express your answer as a fraction. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to type one over four. Remember, you can use this button if you need to. All right, one fourth. I'm going to clear the drawing so we can go to the next one. Next, enter an expression in the box to write the equation of a line that passes through the point 8, 3, and is parallel to the line that passes through the points. Those. So if we want parallel, we want to find the slope and then use the same slope because parallel means same slope. So we need the slope passing through those two points. Here's the formula. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Remember that if you're subtracting your Y values, that's essentially the rise. If you're subtracting your x values, that's essentially the run. So this is rise over run. Over here, um, negative 5, negative 1, that's your x. My gosh, it doesn't like it when I write x1, y1. That's your negative 5 and your negative 1. And your x2, x2, y2, that's your 1, comma, negative 4. Okay? x comes first, y comes second. So we have y2 minus y1. That's 4 minus negative 1. x2 minus x1, 1 minus negative 5. Simplify. 4 plus 1 is 5. Subtracting a negative is adding. 1 plus 5 is 6. Our slope is 5 over 6. Any questions? Oh, shoot. <laughs> That's a negative 4. You might have said that. Nope, no one said that. It's okay. Let's undo that. This is not a five. There we go. Sorry, my bad. I read that y2. I read the y2 and the four, but it's a negative four, so I fix it. So it's negative four minus negative one. That gives us um, negative four plus one, so that's a negative three. And then we have one minus negative five on the bottom, so it's six on the bottom. So it's negative three over six, we need to simplify this. This is negative one half because both top and bottom are divisible by three. If you type something in the chat, type it to my iPad, okay? So this is a slope. But, um, that's the slope between these two points. So now we want a parallel line. Parallel means we're gonna keep the same slope, so y is equal to mx plus b. I'm going to write y is equal to negative one half x plus b. We kept the slope as negative one half. We want it to put, we want it to pass through the point eight three. So here's your x, here's your y. Plug it into the formula. Our y is three is equal to negative one half. Our x was eight. plus b. Okay, so we're going to solve from here. So I'm going to rewrite over here. I'm going to continue there. We have 3 is equal to negative 1 half times 8. We're going to multiply the negative 1 and the 8, so that's negative 8 over 2 plus b. We can simplify this. Negative 8 divided by 2, that's negative 4. And then solving for b, we're just going to add 4 add 4, you get 7 is equal to b. Your final answer is not 7. You want to plug it back into this guy. 
Okay, so we want to plug it back in here. So y is equal to negative one half x plus seven. This is your final answer, and you need to type the y equals with it. Well, actually, it says enter an expression in the box to write the equation. That's very confusing because expression and equation are different things. But I'm going to say write the y equals. So we're going to write the y equals in. And then I'll check later on on Edulastic to see what they wanted from us. Oh, it doesn't have to have it? Oh, thanks. Sam says it doesn't have to have it because it says an expression. So thanks, Sam. Then you guys can type, oh, I see the y equals is here. Then you can type the negative 1 half x plus 7. So I didn't see the y equals here. Since there's a y equals here, we don't need to type our y equals. Thank you, Sam. So here's our final equation, negative 1 half x plus 7. All right. So let me pause the video or pause the recording. All right. So I'm going to clear all the annotations. And we're going to do the next one. OK, here's a graph. Graph f of x minus 3. So when you have a minus 3, that literally just means um, move the graph down 3. So we're going to just literally take this graph and move it down 3 points. And how do we move it down 3? We're going to find an old point. So let me see. Here's another point. And here's another point. I'm just literally going to take those old points. So this one was 0, 1. And this one was 3, 7. We're literally just going to subtract 3 from the y value. The only thing you're changing is the y value, OK? So we're going to subtract 3 from the y value. So here, 0, 1 minus 3, which turns into 0, um, negative 2. So this is what we're going to plot for this point. And then for the 3, 7, we're just going to change the 7, if it would let me write properly. So we have 7 minus 3, because we're moving it down 3, and that would turn into 3 comma 4. 7 minus 3 is 4. So this is the point we're going to plot that changed from this top point. <laughs> so I'm going to plot 0, negative 2, and 3, 4 on the bottom. I think it's OK if I scroll. Actually, let me erase some of that. Let's erase this. There we go. OK, I'm going to scroll now. So we want to plot this point. So I think you click line and then 0, negative 2. I click that over here. And then I'm going to take my other point that appeared. I'm just going to drag it to 3, 4. So here we go. Here's our two points that we plotted. So you have to drag your second point. It's just going to appear somewhere, and then you just have to drag it to where you want it to be. OK. And then let's do the last one. Oh, let me, let me clear my drawings. <laughs> clear. OK. Tom has saved $390. He plans to spend $30 each month for music lessons. That function describes the savings in um, dollars as a function of time in months. Graph the function that describes Tom's savings, S in dollars as a function of time, T in months. Each unit on the x-axis represents one month, and each unit on the y-axis represents $30. So I'm going to label that. I know you can't label it on your computer, but I would, I would like to. So they said every unit is a 1 on the time. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like that. I'm just going to label that much. And then for the y-axis, everything is 30. So that means here would be 60. I'm just going to go by 60s because I can't write that small. So it's 30, 60, 90, 120. Let's see, 120. This one would be 180. And of course, you can use scratch paper when you are um, doing your actual test. So I highly recommend you actually you know, label it on your scratch paper because there's no labels here. Otherwise, it would be ridiculously hard for you to do this without labels. I'm trying to write 240. OK, that's 240.
my gosh. Annotating on this touchscreen computer is very difficult. I apologize. So this says 60, 120, 180, 240, 300, and 360, just because I can't write smaller. So I'm not gonna write it by um, 30s. I wrote it by 60s. But now that we labeled it, I just realized I have to scroll and move all my labels, but I need to see. So <laughs> the function is negative 30t plus 390. Okay, negative 30t plus 390. I'm gonna write it out. Negative 30t t plus 390. Okay, so when you are graphing this, um, let's start off with our y-intercept. The y-intercept is the number that's at the very end. So if it says plus 390, that means we have a y-intercept at 390. This is the point 390 because it's on the y-axis and it is 390 top. Okay, and then we have our slope. Our slope is going down by 30. Okay, so it says minus 30t. That means every single time, every single month, we're going to go down by 30. So that means, here, let me show you by plugging in a number. Negative 30. We're going to plug in the first month. So I'm going to plug it in above this point. Plus 390. That's going to give us negative 30 plus 390, which gives us 360. So as you can see, we went from 390 to 360 on the second dot that I'm trying to plot right there. So we've gone down by 30 every single month. And then we can just connect those two lines. I don't know why they gave us a segment, but not a line. That's okay. And then you can just drag it longer, but make sure like you don't want to put it like that because I'm not going through my point anymore, right? I'm just going to make sure that it goes through my point. Okay, and then I'm going to put it right there. So I just want to connect the two axes and make sure that my segment goes through the point that I solved for. So if I got 360 by plugging in one, that's the point one comma 360. So I connect those two with this line segment. And I don't know what they want with the point, so I'm just going to plot my point here. <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't very clear. Okay. Any questions on this one? This is our last one. And then I'm just going to go over the whatever edulastic marks is wrong. Also, if you have to go, you have to go, it's fine. Remember, this is all recorded. Okay. Alrighty. Now I'm going to submit, or actually, no, I need to clear all my annotations. Clear all drawings. All right, now we submit and then see what they wanted out of us. So this one's good. This one's good. This one's good. That one's fine, fine, fine. Okay. 384, 786. After eight months, is that? I think that's just edulastic being wrong. So 3, 6, 12, 24, 48 times 2. So this would be a sixth term and the seventh term. Eighth term. Now, this one, edulastic was just wrong. It is 384, OK? So I'll correct that. OK, this one, they just wanted you to put a multiplication sign in between. That is very minor. I would mark this as correct anyways, because Literally, this is how you multiply. You don't have to put the multiplication symbol. Okay, so that's fine too. Just want to make sure I didn't explain anything wrong, if that makes sense. Okay, as you can see, we have the exact same graph, and yet it is marked wrong, so I would fix that also. Okay. <laughs> All right, there we go. That concludes our going over the review, and I'll see you guys next time. Okay, have a good rest of your day. Good luck on your other finals.